Hi, my name's Mia Bayes and I run Bird's Eye View and we are a mission bringing a greater audience to by women. And I'm delighted to be welcoming Eliza Hitman. We've been on the Eliza Hitman train since the beginning, since we started life as a film festival and we showed several of her shorts and we have followed her career and we've actually championed every one of her films and we are going to be talking specifically about her third movie the silver bear um winner this year at the berlin film festival never really sometimes always um and so basically for those of you who don't know who birds of you are we started life as a film festival and now we're a year-round mission bringing ever greater audiences to films by women we are we're called bird's eye view because the, the camera position but also in slang in the UK, bird is also a woman. Um, but primarily it's a but it's a camera position and of course the bird sees everything and it's not a superior point of view, it's an expansive point of view. Um, and our mission is specifically called Reclaim the Frame and we are, I have my badge on here, and we are supported by the British Film Institute. So the work that we do is invest in releases of films by women and so this is one of the releases that we have invested in. Um, most of the time we spend uh, touring the UK and the 12 cities in which we have partnership cinemas and a lot of our audiences will be out there from across the country and uh, as you all are aware our beloved cinemas are all now closed um, but it's really important that we keep out keep the fires burning and keep everyone's appetites wetted and also remember that the cinemas need support. Um, so I would like to hand over to Rachel Hayward who is at uh, home in Manchester, who are a really important ally and part of the Reclaim the Frame Net Network. And Rachel is going to introduce the session and the film. Rachel. Thanks, Mia. It's great to join Bird's Eye View and especially to join Eliza Hitman today. So many thanks for asking me to join you. I've got a few minutes of spoiler free introduction. So in this film, we're following 17 year old Autumn and her teenage cousin Skylar on a journey of huge personal significance. Never rarely, sometimes, always is the film that I've been talking about from this year's Berlin Film Festival. It's a deserved winner of awards from that festival and from Sundance as well. And I have recommended it so, so many times. And I'm really, really pleased to be joining this event today. This is a film which is harrowing, yet warm, and always honest and authentic to the teenage experience. Eliza Hitman makes a powerful comment on the reality of being a teenager and also shows us regular microaggressions towards young women, showing us how that reality of being a teenager can be quite scary. And these small moments in the film are, I think, incredibly effective. Personally, I'm really drawn to films and to books and art that are about sisters or about female relatives and their relationships. And this particular film is a, is a really, really great example which gets that relationship just right, in my opinion. Autumn and Skylar's bond and the tension within their relationship is authentic. And um, so there's another word, authentic. Um, their devotion doesn't need to be spoken. Um, that look or a, a, a touch um, is enough to show their solidarity and anger between the pairs accepted that's absolutely fine as well the depth of their relationship is so beautifully and sensitively portrayed through um eliza hitman's spot on script so eliza wrote and um directed and the performances um for me from uh from talia Ryder and from uh sydney flanagan are spot on too um and it's uh, sydney's debut um acting role as Autumn, which for me is just quite phenomenal to think that this is this is a first piece. For me, I really like as well that the film does focus on Autumn. It's about what she experiences. Um, we don't necessarily get so much of the, the peripherals. This is very centered and anchored as a film. It's very much her story, her film. From the opening of the film, I'm not going to spoil, um, from the opening of the film, you see Autumn set apart from her peers, and um, she's kind of slightly out of out of time, out of um, out of place in a way. Um, but we also see her absolute strength of character and her singularity, um, and it's that which 
it drives us and, and her absolutely through the film. As a curator, um, I'm really excited by championing a wide range of voices. And at home, a venue in Manchester, as opposed to my home, um, just like Bird's Eye View, we promote and celebrate the work of a wide range of women filmmakers. And absolutely, we, we partner regularly um, with Bird's Eye View to do this. From January 19 until February of this year, um, we programmed Celebrating Women in Global Cinema, which was a dedicated focus on historical and contemporary work. So a kind of women's filmmaker, women filmmakers takeover, if you like. And Eliza's film uh, is, is exceptional and it would most definitely have continued that work. And it, and it does in this guise. Um, and it would have been a high point in our theatrical program this year. However, um, whilst we're not able to screen the film in the venue, it is absolutely fantastic um, to team up with Eliza and especially, uh, you know, to have this face to face and to team up with Bird's Eye View and to support this online initiative. For me, Never Rarely, Sometimes Always tells a story that matters. And it's a film that I think should be sparking conversations for years to come. Um, and if you love the film as much as I do, then it absolutely will do that. Thank you very much. Enjoy the chat and thanks for asking me, Mia. Wonderful. Thank you, Rachel. Lovely to see you. Eliza, so you're beaming in uh, from Brooklyn, New York, and uh, we're going to offer the caveat that you have a five-year-old who may burst in any second. And a puppy. And a puppy. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so, so this is what the behind the scenes of a working filmmaker look like. Yeah. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for such a generous introduction and for supporting every film I've ever made. And I'm so sorry we can't all be together in person, but maybe at another point in the year, I'll be able yes. to come over and we can do this again. Yes, and we're giving you a virtual hug instead. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Eliza, let's start at the beginning. I wanted to just queue up um, your your kind of film, your start in film, actually, before mm -hmm. we actually dig into Never Really, Sometimes, Always, which I, I saw through tears for, I think, most of the duration of the film at Sundance. Uh, it was such a pleasure to see it. Kind of amongst the first, there was something so delightful, and especially having seen your other movies, too, to watch the progression of your career. Um, but let's start at the beginning. So did you choose film or did it choose you? Um, I, I pursued it in a way. Um, I come primarily from a theatre background and I've done theatre my whole life. And film seemed like another world and it seemed incredibly daunting to me, like something that was almost out of reach and impossible. Um, and at a certain point um, in the theater world, I felt like I kind of hit a wall very early on. I was just making like very small fringe productions in little black boxes. And there were these incredibly, like these incredibly stressful sandcastles that, you know, I would build and then they were gone. Um, and, um, you know, I'd only been on a film set one or two times. It's a funny story. I was once an extra in a Hal Hartley movie. And that was the first time I was really, or second time I was maybe on a film set. And I didn't understand it at all. It was like stepping into, like, onto a construction site. And I was like, how, you know, how, how does this work? And that was maybe one of the first times that as an adult, I was like intrigued by the experience with stepping onto that set. Um, and then I, I sort of like hit a professional wall and I realized if I ever wanted to have any kind of career, I needed to get out of the theater. Um, and everybody, you know, you know, suggested grad school and in the theater world, CalArts has this tremendous reputation as a theater school. And for some reason, I, I, got, I got CalArts in my head. And um, there's this incredible book by uh, a director you might know who comes from your country, Alexander McKendrick, called On Filmmaking. That's all amazing. about, yeah, amazing book. And I read that book and I was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to graduate school. 
um, never having made a movie and try and demystify this incredibly complex technical, you know, these complex technical processes. So I really, you know, started making films in graduate school in my late twenties. Um, and it was something, you know, that felt just incredibly out of reach for me my whole life until that moment. Um, and then, you know, in graduate school, I made, you know, three short films, one every year. And um, one of them played at Bird's Eye View, my thesis. Wonderful. And then, um, so I'd like to ask you a couple of questions about your about your other movies. So <laughs> it felt like Love, Beach Rats, mm -hmm. Never Really. Um, they're all, I, I wanted to cover more the kind of topic. Um, the perspective is all about young people going through something quite painful and mm -hmm. and so your gaze is just yeah I feel like you upend cliches you're really it's a very empathic warm gaze where you also don't pull any punches either mm -hmm. um, and so I just wondered where where does that where does is that just did that happen by chance or did you set out to was there an ambition behind telling young people's stories I think it was a little accidental and um, that I made three features that have such a clear through line. Um, you know, I did initially, when I went to graduate school, I wrote my essay on wanting to make really smart, artful films for young people, for young audiences. And I think that's something that's always intrigued you know, intrigued me because so much work for young people is very message driven or presents growing up in this very generalized way. And I don't know, I always thought there was something really lonely and painful about the experience, you know, that I've tried to capture on film. Uh, my first feature, It Felt Like Love, um, you know, it was a micro budget, very, very inexpensive film you know that I wrote and conceived of very practically so that I could make it totally myself right. um, and you know it explores really explores the painful realization that a young woman has when she realizes she's not desirable um, and yeah I'm just kind of always looking for ways to explore this other side of um, growing up, and I always think of my films as being outtakes, showing these mm. parts of our experiences that you wouldn't ordinarily see on film. Oh, I love that. Can we put a pin in that and come back to that? Because mm -hmm. um, I'd like to now dig into Never Really, Sometimes, Always, and it's an extraordinary piece of work. I don't think I'm the first to tell you that. I think the critics and the, certainly the film festival run has told you that. Um, and but it took you eight years. So can you just talk about sort of the genesis of it and 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 you know how why did it take so long? Talk us through the kind of early early stages. Well, you know the origins of the film um, come from the UK, right? And I started thinking about the film in 2012 when I read about the death of Savita Halepanever. Um, in Ireland who died of a, a septic miscarriage after being denied a life-saving abortion. And I was really sad and I just started reading about Ireland and the Eighth Amendment and how all these women would travel via ferry to London to get abortions and then back. And again, it's like, you know, women take that journey all over the world um, and yet nobody has ever explored it on film. And yet it's this, you know, painful journey and passage that so many people have taken, but would never speak of. And, and again, I thought it was kind of like um, an outtake, you know, this thing, this experience that we all, you know, many people have gone through, but would never, but would be sort of buried in our memories. And I'm always trying to sort of excavate those experiences that people try and bury. Mm -hmm. um, and I wrote a treatment for it. And um, it was initially set in the UK. And then I didn't think I, anybody would get behind me from the UK to make that story. Although I liked it a lot. 
And I began to just think about how can I transpose that narrative to the United States? And I began to research a version of it and wrote like in tandem, a treatment set in the United States that was a little bit different than the film, you know, ended up being, but it was all just kind of exploring similar ideas of this journey. And then sort of in the research process for that film, I became pregnant and I decided to sort of put the project on hold, not because of the connection between pregnancy so much, is that I knew there was all this research that I wanted to do on the film and I didn't feel like I would be able to do it necessarily with a baby. And I decided to sort of make something more localized, which I had also been thinking about, which was Be Chats. Um, but the project lived inside me for a long time. And I even tried, you know, pitching it in 2013. Um, and mostly people thought it was like a documentary idea because people have very binary ways of sort of thinking about um, film. And um, yeah, and then, you know, Trump was inaugurated in 2017 and I premiered Beach Rats. And when I was at Sundance with that movie, people just started asking me, what are you going to make next? And this was the film, you know, the film just kind of kept bubbling up inside me and I knew that I wanted to make it because of how much, you know, we were anticipating um, his administration to roll back women's rights mm -hmm. and access to care and reproductive care. Um, so I, I picked up the project again um, and yeah, that was sort of the beginning, but there was a lot of, you know, a lot of sort of research phases of it as I went and um, you know, I just tried to sort of know and learn as much as, that, as I could about um, the real journey that people would take and also sort of fictionalize it, I guess, as much as possible and think about it from the perspective of a minor. Mm -hmm. And I read a quote from you that said, the character is a bit of a fantasia of what I perceive myself to be, but the events are not auto autobiographical, mm -hmm. but emotionally autobiographical. Mm -hmm. I think that was more from, um, it felt like love actually. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got it. Um, mm -hmm. So in terms of how, did, so can you talk a bit more about kind of the, was there anything that surprised you in the research process? I mean, it's a fine line, isn't it? Because as you said, you're you're you're, you're wanting to make something cinematic and mm -hmm. not, you know, it's an experiential. It's very clear time frame, and you know, it's 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 in to all intents and purposes a kind of small story, but the personal is political mm -hmm. in this case. So, you know, in terms of kind of authenticity, a bit of an overused word, mm -hmm. you know, what is that a bind sometimes? Did you kind of feel like you didn't want to align it with any one particular story? Can you just mm -hmm. talk a bit more about that? Yeah, I think, you know, that the challenge, you know, in terms of authenticity really came down to the clinics in New York because I am i wasn't making a documentary and I consulted a lot with Planned Parenthood, but at the same time, I couldn't include everything to make it real, you know, so... I, you know, talked to social workers, I talked to financial departments, I talked to providers about the procedure, and I gathered all of this information because it had to be credible, you know, but at the same time, you know, that wasn't the film, you know, and the film is really her experience going through it, and I had to be selective about what moments to include and how to show them. Um, and, you know, I just, I think the, the key for me was that, you know, in a sea of sort of research and information to remind myself that we're really seeing and experiencing this from the eyes of a 17 year old yep. and how she would process it. Um, yep. and that was, you know, obviously I want the audience to, especially a male audience to sort of know what the process is, but I had to be very selective in what to show. Um, and I think in doing that, I was also worried about, you know, offending or alienating Planned Parenthood. It was a little bit of a, a balance and a dance, I would say. Yeah, got it. Okay. And 
Um, do you can you talk a little bit about the process of casting? Like how how mm -hmm. at what point did you did you find the two extraordinary with girls that lead this film? Mm -hmm. I'm kind of um, I'm kind of a casting director's worst nightmare. Um, because I like a lot of time and I like to see a lot of people to learn about the character and to crystallize for me, you know, what will make the film most effective, if that makes sense. Um, and initially, you know, there, the casting process was extensive and we looked, you know, at every young woman in Hollywood and every young actress. And we cast, you know, we did open calls with, you know, young women. We met at county fairs in the region of Pennsylvania. Um, and, um, you know, it's a sort of peculiar story, but my partner who edited the movie is also a filmmaker. And in 2013, he was making a film. And in the casting of that movie, uh, we met Sydney, who plays Autumn, like years and years and years and years ago. And in order to, you know, she was just a kid um, at an event that we met. And we, everybody we met at this one event, we added on Facebook. And for some reason, Sydney over the years kept showing up in our Facebook feeds. And she would write these like really lengthy emotional posts about, you know, who she was in love with and how they made her feel. And then a few weeks later, it was just all about the torment of the heartbreak and it was all honest. And then she would post these very raw music, like videos of herself alone in a bedroom playing guitar. Um, so I felt like we were kind of like tracking Sydney's wow. coming of age story on Facebook and, um, you know, in sort of parallel to sort of casting the film, I kind of always kept thinking about her, but she was not an actor. And then when we got really close to the beginning of prep, I just said, okay, and we hadn't cast the role. I was like, we have to bring this girl to New York to audition her and we did. Um, and then Talia, who's also fantastic, um, you know, we found more traditionally and she came through just a, a regular kind of agency and did a traditional audition. Um, but very coincidentally, they turned out to be from the same place. Wow. And I thought that was really interesting and it became a little bit of a foundation to begin building this relationship on screen. Right. right. And one of the questions um, from Kate Lane um, asks um, on the note of the actors, how, it, what the techniques and tools are for working with actors on such emotionally demanding roles, mm -hmm. especially when they don't have training? Mm -hmm. I think a little bit the, the, the fun for me of working with people who don't have training is that, you know, they're very intuitive and they understand that like acting is doing and young people kind of dive in. Um, and I, you know, I don't think like everybody always thinks, oh, Eliza is like somebody who works with the first time actors. But the reality is, is that I'm discovering, you know, talent. And I believe that that talent you know, I have confidence in that talent. I'm not teaching Sydney a real person how to act. She was a real person who did an audition that I had confidence in. Yep. Um, and there was a lot of intuitive understanding of, um, you know, the, like, you know, performance, um, as, you know, and uh, I didn't, you know, I didn't have to sort of break her in, like her intuition and her impulses and what she was doing was already really great. Um, there were a lot of things, you know, that, you know, she had to get comfortable with, like having a crew around her. You know, those were like adjustment things that happened over the course of the first few days on set because we didn't have a real rehearsal. Um, but yeah, you know, I don't cast like real people and then teach them to act. Like I discover, you know, people who are interested in performing and then realize that they have acting talent, I mm -hmm. guess, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Yep, that does make sense. Um, 
So um, Andrew Simpson is the uh, programmer at the Tyneside Cinema in Newcastle, who w would definitely would have been a, a key screen in supporting this movie theatrically. Uh, and he asked about the central scene that, of course, gives the film its title and and about how incredibly emotionally affecting it is um, in its communication of both Autumn, our lead character's strength, but also her vulnerability. Mm -hmm. And can you just talk a bit about how you built that scene? Mm -hmm. um, I workshopped that scene on the page extensively and I consulted with um, a social worker from a clinic, an independent private clinic called Choices that's in Queens. Um, and then I ended up casting a real social worker. I re ended up casting the social worker that I had been consulting with. Um, and we worked for a long time on the scene and workshopped it so that it would play out in a way that, you know, was authentic to what she does and the work she does and sort of work to marry it with this sort of stylistic rhythm of the film and the dialogue of the film. Um, on the day that we shot the film, I found like a really quiet space for Sydney to sit in Planned Parenthood. And we went through the scene multiple times. And because it was so long, like 10 pages, um, the one kind of key piece of direction that I gave Sydney, which I think really unlocked the performance, was I told her to start the scene as herself you know, and answer all the general intake questions as Sydney. So the questions about smoking, the questions about family history in the very beginning where it's general and not intimate. Um, she really started from a personal place and then was able to kind of shift into the, the script and answer from a more vulnerable place, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and we shot it in a long take. So there was something about the, the sort of pressure of that, um, that and the cameras were very close to her. Um, you know, Sydney is a very vulnerable and emotional actress and that's why we cast her. And I can't say that you know, I know specifically what she was drawing from because that's her process. Mm -hmm. um, but I knew and I had confidence that she could access it if I helped her personalize the scene at the outset of shooting it. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um, Paul, who's the programmer at the Glasgow Film um, Theatre, um, asked how much staying on Sydney in autumn um, how much of Autumn's backstory did you map out and share with Sydney beforehand? Because he mm -hmm. says, I was so impressed with the economy of the film storytelling and with her deep felt performance and just wondered mm -hmm. how you approached that. Um, I, I think the, the priority for me in the one day that we had to rehearse the film was to bond Sydney and Talia as much as possible and bond them as real people and real young women versus like inventing elaborate histories that wouldn't exist on screen. Um, and I, I think that there's a little bit of a danger in creating backstories because character people, actors can get in their head. Um, so in terms of their relationship, um, I spent you know, a few hours with them or I gave them these notebooks and I wrote very marble like kind of school notebooks and I wrote very personal prompts in them for them to answer that were about things I knew about them and their families and overlap between their coming of age experiences. And I left. So they wrote these deeply personal responses and then shared them privately. Wow. Um, and it was a way to bond them in a deep and real way. And the bond that you see on screen is really their bond together. And I wanted them to be really genuinely connected and not artificially connected yep. as characters. Um, and I, that was like, th that was a big priority for me in the rehearsal. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and in terms of Sydney's performance, I think, um, you know, part of what I saw in her videos 
on Facebook was a real depth and vulnerability and rawness and also a strength that inherently was coming through her performances, you know, even in these little videos that she was making. And that was something that is, is it's part of her, even though she has, mm -hmm. you know, also a much lighter side than the character that we see on film. Mm -hmm. Some of it is, um, you know, who she is and some of it is, you know, the situations that the character goes through. Mm -hmm. I mean, you put that performance, I mean, that, that the performance that she gives at the, near the start of the film, the musical mm -hmm. performance, it's, I mean, exactly what you're describing. It's so painful. You can just see that there's so much going on for this young woman. I mean, she tells us as well, the lyrics, mm -hmm. but also mm -hmm. the performance. And so that's really beautiful to know that that's really her. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I think, um, you know, it's also, there's, there's so many layers to sort of what builds a performance on screen. You know, I think the, you know, she was very fragile in New York in a way and the pressure of the movie. Um, but there, there, you know, she does have an ability to be incredibly sincere on camera and she was like that from beginning to end and it was so intimate you know that the performance um i'm not sure if people who were on a monitor like a you know a, a cheap monitor at a video village would have seen or felt it but when you were standing with her on set you know you could just she just radiated vulnerability mm -hmm. And how do you direct? Are you really, so you're obviously not in Video Village, you're standing really, you're mm -hmm. next to camera. Mm -hmm. I'm right next to the, the cinematographer at all times. And I like to have as few people around us as possible. Um, and I'm always like asking people to leave. And I think it's because I'm also small, I'm like five foot tall and I hate feeling the presence of all these bodies kind of hovering over me. So I'm always trying to get rid of people. And I really believe that when actors are, um, you know, acting on a film set, they're acting for the director. And I feel very connected to the performance that's being given. And I have a cinematographer who I trust, you know, I can check the frame on a monitor and then focus on the performance. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, Sydney and Talia hadn't acted before, a lot of times I would roll long takes and then I would, you know, just quietly off screen, give small direction and do it in the middle of a take. And then, you know, in the edit, we took that obviously all out, but I would just let things roll and we would try and find things and discover things, you know, in the moment. Mm. Well, it's incredibly effective because the film feels it's just has this incredible intimacy like sometimes you should like you shouldn't it feels almost like as a viewer you shouldn't be there it's it's an incredible skill thank you um there was a quote i love that you talked about you wanted to explore and that the the how antagonistic the environment is for a young woman um, that so much of becoming a young woman is learning to navigate and deflect the male world. I mean, that's relevant to this, and it's also relevant to It Felt Like Love as well. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about your exploration? Mm -hmm. I think um, with Never Rarely, Sometimes Always, I was playing with this you know, classical structure of a hero's journey, but in my own way. And in a hero's journey, there's always an antagonistic or, you know, an, an antagonist that the protagonist comes up against and is an obstacle in their, in their desire to sort of get, you know, get, get their goal. And um, in lieu of having this one person, I didn't want it to be a parent. I didn't want it to be a boyfriend. Um, Cause really what I, you know, was, extract, was exploring were these structural barriers that are in her way. Um, but I knew that wasn't enough in the writing. And I was just thinking a lot about how, you know, the environment at that age can be so hostile uh, to a young woman and, and what it's like to realize that. And I think that as you grow older, you become desensitized to those exchanges 
um, and they become part of just the way that you move through the world. But when you're young, you know, they're, they're, they're more intensified because you're discovering them for the first time. Mm -hmm. So I played with, you know, these sort of male peripheral figures um, who were, you know, hostile and, and, you know, not very kind to these young women along their journey. And it sort of culminates in the exchange that Skylar has with this kid they meet on the bus. But I wanted all these small moments to sort of, these small exchanges and interactions to build to this one larger sequence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you said, I mean, is it true that some men have been a bit miffed, some male viewers been a bit miffed about the representation of men in the movie? I've seen it online and people have, you know, relayed that kind of feedback to me. It's obviously, you know, not something that keeps me up at night. <laughs> um, yeah, don't let it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't think, you know, I saw a really funny Facebook comment actually from somebody about Jasper, this kid that they meet in the bus. Um, and it was something like, you know, 10 years ago, like he would have been so cool um, on film. And it's like, yeah, that's right. But we're at a moment of unpacking you know, and reevaluating that kind of behavior. And I feel like, you know, that's what this, this film so much is about. And can you talk also about, um, I mean, one of your points um, I've read in several interviews is about that women just still do not have power over their own bodies. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think even more so in this moment in this, you know, pandemic, um, which, you know, has been a really, you know, disheartening part of sitting at home and reading the news is reading about all these politicians who deemed in five states abortion to be non-essential care. Um, and um, I don't know, it's really just unfortunate that that access, you know, became a central point in navigating what stays open and what, you know, should close. And you'd think in the middle of a, a global health crisis, there would be more access to healthcare, not less. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it's, you know, it's, you know, we're always in, in this country anyway, sort of battling for our bodies. Mm -hmm. and, and can you talk a little bit about how that what's the experience been like of actually you know showing the film what 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 have what has surprised you about um touring it i mean i guess your tour was somewhat thwarted but you did mm -hmm. you did sundance and then you came to berlin mm -hmm. you know what's been the reception like in different places has anything surprised you um i can tell one anecdote which I was very moved by, but at Sundance, I, you know, at Sundance, you screen the film largely for an industry audience, but there's then these screenings in Salt Lake City. And I was most excited about the screening in Salt Lake City because it was going to be our sort of real audience screening. Um, and there were a group of teen bloggers who uh, work with Planned Parenthood to do education in public schools in Utah. And I was just really like really moved by meeting with these young young people after the screening. Um, and they were telling me that, you know, and stuff I knew, but you, you know, it's stuff that you don't process necessarily the impact that it has. But in Utah, you, you can't teach sex education. You can't talk about sex in public schools and they have to preach abstinence. So these young women were tasked with the responsibility of educating without being able to talk about sex. Um, and they were telling me about how they secretly pass out condoms in their public school. Wow. Um, and I just think, you know, you know, what's moved me most is, you know, being brought closer to the realities that people face. And that was really what I wanted the film to achieve was to bring audiences closer to confronting difficult realities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Um, Rose Baker, who we work with in Belfast, actually, um, says it's so interesting that the project was initially about the laws and experiences in Ireland, Northern Ireland, UK, <laughs> but that during the time the project unfolded, the situation actually worsened in the US. Mm -hmm. um, so her point was just just showing how pre precarious women's rights are at any point in time, anywhere geographically. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, it feels more like a comment than a question. Um, but yeah, I think you know it's something that we're we're living through at the moment. Also, yes. you know, is the continued battle for access. Yes, exactly. Um, so there was a question also, or rather a point actually, from Deborah Hayward, who's actually a, a wonderful director who's not officially supported. And she just made a comment, which I love, the loneliness, it's so heartbreaking that she has to go through this alone, even if she's not alone, she's alone. Mm -hmm. You know, actually, I mean, that is, it is, it's, I mean, we're all profoundly alone, actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and that's part of growing up, isn't it? But, mm -hmm. you know, she hasn't got the tools and, you know, just, yeah, I mean, maybe going back to that point of how you wrote the character and what you were wanting to, to the audience to take away from the experience. Mm -hmm. You know, was that a big part of it, the, the solitude? Yeah, the solitude and the burden. The burden of going through it alone was something I thought a lot about. And, you know, that even though she has this non judgmental, you know, cousin friend with her on the journey, that what she experiences in those, in the procedure isn't something that she would really talk about. So yeah. they're together, you know, but there's, she's still alone. Um, yeah. And that was important to me um, because I do think that these topics are still so stigmatized and I do think that we are, you know, taught not to speak about them. Yep, yep, exactly. And um, what other art, artists, films helped guide the way? Did you look at, I mean, obviously Vardas tackled it. There are obviously, there are a number of seminal films. It doesn't feel like it's very interrogated in cinema, but it has been. I mean, mm -hmm. How much did you look at or not look at other work? Um, I, you know, I think for me, it's hard to look at other films while I'm making a film because I start to see those movies and I get very anxious. Like it's never gonna be as good as this movie. I'll, I'll never make a movie as effective or stunning as this one. Um, so, but you know, I, I was thinking about, you know, the representation and especially um, in the United States, the focus in films about abortion tend to linger in the decision, you know, and this moral dilemma. And yeah. I don't believe that that's so interesting or true. I think a lot of people know who've been through this know in their heart what's best for them, even if it is, you know, difficult. Um, so I tried to sort of steer clear of any kind of dilemma. Um, so not to overlap with kind of that territory and that approach. Um, I did watch, you know, some some Ken Loach movies. I watched Lady Bird, Lady Bird to sort of go back and say, like, how did he do it? Um, I watched, you know, I was intrigued by a lot of Romanian New Wave films. Obviously, Four Months, Three Weeks, Two Days was a film that I like a lot and also wanted to sort of reclaim that narrative and, you know, look at it from a female point of view. Um, I'm trying to think of other things. Those, are, those were sort of big ones. Yep. Okay. And then, and who, what influences you sort of generally? I, I mean, I read from everything from John Hughes to Truffaut to Bresson. Um, and what about women? I'd love, yeah, like who, who inspires you? Who's influenced you generally? Sure. Um, I love Catherine Briat. I love Agnes Varda. I love Claire Denis, I love, um, I mean, there's a there's an equally long list, I would say, of women. Um, I'm trying to think of other films. You know, I, I liked, obviously, I thought a lot about Fast Times at Ridgemont High, which is an American film that has, you know, an abortion directed by a woman. Um, yeah, the, list is, the lists are endless. Mm -hmm. 
And what's exciting, before we actually talk, I'd like to go back to the first two films. Um, mm -hmm. What's exciting you at the moment? Did you see other stuff that you loved at Sundance? Like, who do you think's exciting at the moment in terms of your contemporary filmmakers? Um, I didn't get to watch so much at Sundance or Berlin, okay. unfortunately. We're busy. I'm busy. Um, what have I watched recently? I really loved, I've been catching up. I really loved Maddie Diop's film, Atlantics. Yes, we worked on that. Yeah, I loved, I watched um, Unorthodox, which I liked a lot on Netflix mm -hmm. in the pandemic. Um, and I, it was nice to see a television show that was more grounded in kind of reality and not in these sort of like hyper genres. And it's like, oh, right, maybe television can be real again. Um, what else? Yeah, I don't know. Just, you know, uh, to be honest, like I'm quarantined with a five-year-old at the moment and we're watching a lot of, you know, his picks for the night. So a lot of Godzilla, destroy, our, destroy all monsters, um, animal shows. And so, and you make films with your partner, Scott Cummings. So he's mm -hmm. also a filmmaker, but he also edits your movies. So yeah. can you talk a bit about that collaboration? Um, you know, it started in graduate school when we met and he edited the first film I ever made. So, you know, our relationship is very dimensional and that we kind of end up talking about movies all the time or, you know, parents together and he edits my films. I think Scott knows my visual strategy very well and how I execute a film. So he's never really surprised by the footage because they tend to come together in similar ways, I would say. Um, and, but he also, uh, because he's an experimental filmmaker, he doesn't adhere to conventional editing strategies. And that's part of what is exciting to work with him. Um, is that like he believes that everything cuts, you know, that there are no rules essentially. And I can sort of stand on set sometimes with a conventional, you know, with a producer and they'll say, how is this going to cut? You know, in the back of my mind, I'm just like, it will cut, everything will be fine. Don't worry about it. Um, because I know that, you know, Scott and I sort of share, you know, similar sensibilities that, you know, we're able to, you know, I'm able to sort of trust what he's going to bring with the film. And there's never a conversation about sort of how things will come together and the tight, you know, what moments I'm trying to punctuate. He knows by how things are shot, sort of what their function is. Mm -hmm. That must be incredibly liberating, actually, the confidence that that gives you all, both. As, yeah. As yeah. And then, you know, the, the interpersonal aspect of it, you know, adds a lot also because, you know, a, a shoot can sort of wear you down in a way and I can, you know, lose confidence easily and he can be on the other end and looking at the dailies and saying, it's great, you know, you know the performance is great and, you know, he can sort of lift me back up in moments where I'm, you know, overwhelmed or, you know, can kind of lose perspective just based mm -hmm. on the sort of intensity and stress of the experience. Mm -hmm. And can you talk about, I mean, what other collaborators, I mean, not necessarily specific people, mm -hmm. although obviously if you want to shout out, please do, but, um, you know, in terms of your, you know, that, I mean, it's interesting, the comment from the filmmaker about how alone the character is, because also there's a point when actually the filmmaker can feel very alone. Mm -hmm. so your network of people mm -hmm. who kind of hold you mm -hmm. are really, really important. Can you just talk about how you learned that? Like, what are the key people? Mm -hmm. How do you find your collaborators? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, you know, through short filmmaking, I learned what I was looking for, like what kind of collaboration. Um, and obviously I think that the, one of the most challenging relationships on set can be the DP and director dynamic. And I, I learned from my short films, you know, what, what those challenges and sort of potential power struggles could be. Um, and um, that took a little bit of time, I would say. And, you know, one of the, the joys for me also is working with Helene Levart, who shot now two of my films. 
And similarly, now we have built a foundation where she sort of understands, you know, and knows kind of how the visual strategy for how I shoot and approach things and think about um, a scene which tends to be very subjectively. Um, so we can work together to build a shot list or the first version of the shot list very quickly because it's easy for her to visualize the approach. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, Scott and Helen are my key collaborators and I love to discuss everything with them, you know, casting and wardrobe and, you know, all of it. I think their perspectives kind of are, you know, in a way creative ballast for me during, you know, what can be very tumultuous and you can have a lot of opinions yeah. and expectations kind of swarming around you and they're, their perspectives are the ones that, you know, I sort of trust most in certain moments. Mm -hmm. Well, it's really working, Eliza. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, going back to It Felt Like Love, um, you said around that film uh, mm -hmm. a, that a lot of teen movies that you like um, mm -hmm. and that you, were that you were addressing and employing the cliches of mm -hmm. sexualize the main character mm -hmm. and that you wanted to do the opposite and... Um, so it's really, I mean, because her, her burgeoning sexuality is a really central part, mm -hmm. but you resist, we don't see mm -hmm. the moments that we kind of expect, we are taught mm -hmm. to expect, and it's really powerful, actually. So can you just talk a little bit about wanting to do the opposite and why? Um, I, you know, I was playing a little bit with um, an anti sort of Lolita narrative with the film and wanted it to be about a girl who is pursuing and aggressively on a self-destructive quest for intimacy. Um, and there, I wanted it to be sort of painful for the audience to watch and not to arouse any pleasure in it. Um, it wasn't gonna, you know, I didn't wanna give the audience a satisfying moment where she gets what she wants. I wanted it to be, you know, play, sort of playing with the magic and horror of her her coming of age story. Um, and, you know, instead of, you know, arousing or like exciting an audience to see her doing something sexual, I wanted them to sort of close their eyes and look away, you know, when she comes close. Yep. Um, and in doing that, you know, I was very cautious about the gaze. Mm -hmm. And the gaze is very much sort of sexualizing him because she's yeah. she's looking at him yeah. in, in an erotic way for the first time, looking at a man in an erotic way. And I never wanted that gaze on her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, the, you know, it's something, you know, I was very much aware of and I think, <laughs> in um, never rarely, sometimes always, there are very sort of few moments that, you know, sexualize the young women. And if it does, it's only from the point of view of Jasper, this kid on yep. the bus. Yep. Um, so I think it's something I'm very aware of. Um, and I unfortunately think that a lot of, you know, directors are less aware of in sort of mainstream filmmaking. Yes, yes, I would absolutely agree with you. Um, although they should be reading some books and articles and becoming more aware of it, but that's just me. Um, now, also on Beach Rats, your second movie, you um, second feature, sorry, um, you said that you also kind of questioned perspe your perspective mm -hmm. in some mm -hmm. way, that, that you were wondering how to tell the story and whether or not you could. Mm -hmm. So can you just um, unpack that a little bit more? You're obviously very aware of, Mm -hmm. earning the, uh, not earning the right to tell the story that's not right but mm -hmm. yeah like what what gaze you're bringing mm -hmm. to I think, yeah um i think yeah it's a, it's a long conversation probably but i think you know the the gaze of the camera is meant to, to capture you know the tension between what's homoerotic um and what's hyper masculine um and you know, this one character in conflict, you know, sort of captures that, con you know, that he's the embodiment of the conflict, essentially. Um, and yeah, I think, 
I am, the film is very much in the vein of a lot of my films and the themes of the film, you know, although I'm not that character, you know, or, you know, were prevalent to my own coming of age. Um, so I don't, I don't know if I ever felt, I think, you know, there, there was, you know, questions around voice appropriation um, yep. of the film and, I don't know. I don't. I don't really agree with that criticism. I think there were a lot of um, sort of. There were some, a handful of you know, gay male audiences who didn't like the representation of the character because he wasn't a victim. Um, and I do think that there's you know, sort of some cliches right. in that in that world. You know, where um, you know, young gay men are martyrs and couldn't. You know, and and couldn't do something like the character does. But I do I do think that obviously internalized homophobia can have you know self-destructive and destructive consequences. And that's yes. really what the film is exploring. Yes. Um, so we've got about five minutes left. So I wanted to just put, um, come back to a couple of um, <laughs> questions from the audience. So Dave McAllister, um, whilst listening to you is is just drawing a very how how um strong your focus is on actors and the emotional performances and asks specifically was your focus on actors something that you think comes from your first experience um no i think my my um my emphasis you know is also on the technical elements and i think it's a balance of all of those things but i would never sit at a video village while the actors are performing because there's something so passive and two-dimensional about that experience um and removed so for me um you know it's about being sort of with the camera and the performance um I, you know, I, I do the first sort of pass of, you know, the the shot list and all that stuff sort of independently and do, you know, do my my director's prep um, and, you know, know what lenses that I want to shoot on. And they're fairly consistent choices, you know, from film to film. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I do think that there's similarities um, in all of my films and how they're shot and um, lit and edited. And there are different collaborators, you know, on those projects. So there's mm -hmm. sort of a consistency in approach throughout. Mm -hmm. And Detti from the Exeter Phoenix Cinema um, said, that ask you what lessons that you learned from the first two features that, you, that helped inform the process of of never really sometimes always i think each each movie is a very different beast um and um you know i can say like some things that i'm thinking about for the next film this film had way too many locations and it posed a lot of like logistical yeah. challenges and you're always learning about productions yeah. as you expand the canvas of the work that you want to make um and those as you expand the canvas you encounter and learn more as you go inherently. Um, so yeah, you know, from this project to the next, just thinking about the logistics of locations and um, you know, there's some writing things that I learned on this film, you know, that I will think about on the next film. And I don't know. I don't know if there's like one lesson from each film. I think that we just inherently grow from movie to movie and project to project. Yes. And was there anything about making this film that sort of surprised you that didn't really go, either didn't go to plan and then there was a happy accident or or just any anything that's kind of interesting insight for, for mm -hmm. us having seen the film that, that's just interesting to now hear? Yeah, I guess um, one, one, one thing that changed from the script to the film uh, in the script initially when she found out she was pregnant, um, she went home and she, she dyed the tips of her hair. Um, and I wanted it to be a moment about taking control of her body and um, processing and thinking about, but Sydney had like cut off her ponytail before coming to New York. Um, she just had a ponytail and she just cut it off. And um, 
she didn't have like the hair to do what we wanted in the script. And I saw the nose piercing and I was like, oh, what if we, you know, use this to substitute the gesture? And it ended up being a stronger choice because, um, you know, it, it's, it's um, you know, shows that she could do something more harmful to herself. Yep. It's foreshadowing and it and yep. it also alludes to the past perhaps that maybe there was something violent that happened to her and it is this act of reclaiming her body. So I don't know, it became its own moment as a result yes. of you wow. know, another idea, you know, being, you know, impossible to execute. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. That's a great place to, to wrap. Um, so, Eliza Hitman, it's been a delight talking to you. Um, for those of you who haven't seen it, you can see the film, and on or, and it's also on, on subtitles um, as well. So we have been live subtitling this conversation for hard of hearing and deaf audiences, Eliza. Um, so just to shout that out and to say that also those audiences can find like, um, subtitled versions of the film on all the platforms um, like iTunes, Amazon, Chile, Rakuten, Google Play, and Sony PlayStation. So please, everyone who hasn't seen it, tell everyone to go and see it too. Um, we're welcoming back Rachel. So, um, so Eliza, thank you very much. Thank I hope you've you. enjoyed that too. And Rachel, would you like to say a few final words? It's been, for me, it's been an absolute pleasure. I've been uh, listening along as well, so it's, you know, hugely interesting to hear you talk about the process and it's given me even more to think about and I'll be watching again on the weekend so thanks thank very much Eliza. Thank you thank for inviting me. Stay well and healthy everyone thank you bye bye <laughs>